Today we're going to be speaking about um, the different ways to hold an animal still during Shrita. Um, and I'm going to start with a little bit of history just to sort of set the tone for what we're going to be talking about. Um, and then we're going to fill in some of the pieces on the more, if you could use the word, halachic issues. And then it's like this. Uh, an animal needs to be held still during Shrita. <coughs> Excuse me. And the main reason for that is to avoid a drasa, which is to say as if the animal were to move, um, then it could press its neck into the knife rather than have the knife slicing through, and that would be a draw, so that would make the animal into an avela. So um, until, I don't know, 100 years ago or so, maybe a little more than that, a little more than 100 years ago, um, the way they did that was, um, the animal was, um, people wrestled the animal to the floor, laid it down on its back, and the sheikh, they held it down, and the sheikh came along and shekhed the animal. Um, but as things became a little bit more industrialized and things changed a little bit, um, people were uncomfortable with the way um, that was done with that idea of just holding the animal down, literally wrestling it to the floor and holding it down. And a very big change happened in 1906. Um, someone printed a book called The Jungle, uh, which has talked about all about the horrible conditions in um, slaughterhouses, not specifically kosher ones, but in slaughterhouses, particularly in the Chicago area, with the workers and the animals, etc. cetera. Uh, and that led to a really big uh, change in public attitude. And shortly thereafter, to what was called the U.S. Pure Dr Food and Drug Act of 1906 and the Meat Inspection Act. And in those, the government set up rules of what it considered to be sanitary and acceptable um, for uh, processing of meat and many other products, and including that they didn't want animals laying in the blood from an, a previous animal that had been slaughtered. And that meant that you really couldn't throw that, put the animal down on the floor when where the last animal had just been slaughtered before him. Um, so that was sort of left uh, slaughterhouses with a problem. They couldn't do things the way they had used to being done. So they moved to something called the uh, shackle and hoist. And shackle and hoist means is um, a chain is <coughs> shackled onto the back leg, <coughs> excuse me, with the two back legs of the animal. And the animal walks into the area <coughs> and it's hoisted up, yanked up by its back legs through this um, chain. And the animal then is sort of dangling there. Uh, so it's shackled on its back leg and hoisted up. Um, and somebody will grab the animal's head to hold it still, and or its nose, with either by hand or with a special tool, and they grab the head and pull the head backwards. That is to say, the head goes all the way back uh, towards its back. Um, and then the neck is sticking out, and, and the animal could be shechted. Um, that's what, uh, that's called, sh that's called shackle and hoist. Um, and that was considered acceptable for a couple of decades. But uh, in 1958, the government passed another set of laws called the Humane Slaughter Act. Uh, and that set is that slaughter must be humane. And it specifically said two ways to make slaughter be considered humane. Uh, and one of them was that the animal needs to be rendered insensitive to pain before it's shackled and hoisted and some other things. So which is to say is that means you can't do shackle and hoisting with an animal that's still alive. <coughs> excuse me. And that's. Um, has not been rendered unconscious. But it also said a second, except another way to do it, and that is if you slaughter in accordance with the ritual requirements of the Jewish faith um, or some other religion, but if you did it according to the Jewish faith, if you did shrita, that was also considered to be humane. So, of course, Jewish people were very happy that the government made an official acknowledgement that shrita is humane. Um, but sort of the undertone of this whole uh, law was that really shackle and hoisting is not humane, and a special exception is being made for shrita, but basically, it's not considered to be humane. Um, so, they, so people started moving away from that. And the government set up something called the National Advisory Committee to the Secretary of Agriculture um, to try to find a way to make, to do shrita in a way that would be considered humane for everybody else, um, but would also would not be an issue for the shrita itself. Um, Rav Salvechik, uh, Rabbi Shaver Salvechik was very involved with that, with, with those dealings of that National Advisory Committee. Um, he testified for the committee two times in 1961 and 64, uh, and they worked together with the ASPCA and with manufacturers of equipment and people, other people in the industry, and eventually <coughs> they created something called, they created a pen, <coughs> now, we'll talk about later exactly what a pen is, but a pen to hold the animal during shrita, um, and they called it the ASPCA pen, excuse me, or the Cincinnati pen. And that became pretty standard in the kosher industry starting from then. So again, the law had allowed, technically had allowed shackling and hoisting as being considered humane if it's done for shrita, but um, the, the Jewish community got together to try to find ways that would not uh, 
to avoid shackling hoisting, they came up with this pen. Now, the truth is, there was another pen right around that time in, in 1960 that was created in Canada, a similar pen. Um, Rav Salvechik and Rav Eliezer Silver both approved of that pen in Canada. The American government wasn't happy with how that came out, so they had to work on this variation, which they called the, what eventually came to be called the ASPCA pen. Okay, now, the idea of a pen, of having a pen to hold the animal in as a way to do shechita rather than shackling and hoisting, um, was actually not invented in the, in the 1950s. It was way back, at least in the 1920s, when a uh, from Jewish tailor, of all things, uh, in England, created a pen. His name was Weinberg, so it was called the Weinberg Casting Pen. Um, and that was also a pen to hold animals. It's at least in the 20s that I see records of it being around. Um, that and that was also a pen that was used in England as a way to hold an animal during shechita. And the big difference between the Weinberg pen and the ASPCA pen is that the Weinberg pen was a rotating pen, meaning after the animal got into the box and it was held in place, as I'll explain to you in a few minutes how that works, then the Weinberg pen rotated 180 degrees, so the animal was sort of laying on its back, um, and the shechita could be done in a way that was a little more traditional, that with the animal laying on its back. As opposed to the ASPCA pen was an upright pen where the animal got was, was held in place in this box in this pen, but it was still standing up. It was upright. Okay, so that that's a little bit of the history of how things went from going from animals laying on the floor to shackle and hoisting and into different types of pens that are used. Now let's go through each of those stages one by one and talk about some of the issues that there are with them. Now, I already mentioned that shackling and hoisting, that was our first method after the animal, you know, the first more modern method way of shechita, that shackling and hoisting um, had questions about whether it's humane, whether it's appropriate, and of course, from the din side of it, um, that raises questions of tzar belichayim. If an animal is, if there are other ways to shecht without causing pain, then as some say, it, it's, a, it's a tzar that's nothing to do with the shechita, um, that's not there for, the, for in order for us to get the meat, and um, that would hire be usher. Okay, that's that's sort of like a, if I could use the word a side issue, it's a tzar kind if there are no other choices. Um, now, but there are a couple of shechita related issues that, or meat related issues that have to do with shackling and hoisting. The simplest one is, the simplest one is that when you um, lift up, when you lift up a <clears throat> animal by its hind legs, you, you hoist it up by its hind legs and you leave it dangling there, you're opening up the uh, very strong possibility of the coolest, that's the, 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 the femur, the very large, the top bone, the bone closest, the leg bone that's closest to the hip um, being ripped out of its socket, which was called, in, in Gemara terms, called a bukudat, medeshaf midukhte, which would make the animal into a trefa. So pulling the animal up like that and hanging it by its leg potentially makes, it would render the animal a trefa um, <clears throat> in a way that, mm, you know, before then, no one ever checked for that kind of trefa. It's very uncommon, and you know who would look for it. Except, I mean, you'd see an animal look wrong if without that. Um, and so, so, and it supposedly at that time when they were doing shackling and hoisting, that was the requirement was to check the animal to make sure it didn't become a trefa in that way. Um, okay, so that, that's a that's the simplest issue, which is by yanking it by its leg and leaving it hanging, then you you may pull the bone out of its socket and there would be a trefa. Okay, but the more s serious issue that people speak about is. The question is, should it be a drasa? And that drasa is from two different angles. The first one is practical. <clears throat> practical is an animal is hanging by its, leg, by its leg. It obviously doesn't feel comfortable and happy hanging like that. Um, so the animal is going to be, sh sh you know, banging itself all around, trying to get out of this uh, very unusual and unnatural position. Um, so when it does that, that it, so you try to hold it still and people are holding it. But if the animal continues to move and moves at all during the shechita, you're opening yourself up <coughs> to the fact that you may have caused, <coughs> excuse me, there may be a drasa from, um, from, from the way it's, from it banging itself into the knife. Now, the truth is that most time, most of the things that would go wrong with the shechita, let's say a shahia, the, the shaykh pauses in the middle of the shechita, or he's a drasa himself, he, he bangs down instead of slicing. It's in the shaykh's control, and he should be alert for that, and he would notice that. It's a little harder to expect him to imagine, to notice when the animal moves in the middle of his shechita, but I guess he would have to keep his eyes open for that. Um, but it's a very difficult thing because you're putting the animal into a position where it's, by all natural means, it would want to get out of there. It would want to move and move in a way that would potentially cause it a trusser. And in fact, 
1958, right around this time, while there's a lot of this was brewing, in 1958, Rabbi Rab Rab Silva wrote a letter into um, a journal that was called Hamar. And in this letter, he writes that because of this problem, that the animal might move and cause a drasa, he said he forbade all of his shechitas from using shackling and hoisting. He would not let any of his places use it, all the places that he was involved in, he would not let them use shackling and hoisting. And he says, and you know when the Ridvaz was in Chicago 50 years bef before me, he also wouldn't let this, for the exact same reason, because of the problem that it might cause a trussa. Um, and uh, he says, no, the younger Rabbanim aren't aware of these things, they don't know, so they've been letting people do this, but we, I don't let it, and uh, the Ridvaz also did not let it in his time when he lived in America. Um, so that's, that's a very practical issue of the of it uh, being a drasa, as, as sort of like an aside to that, is that um, Menashe Klein, he says, when he speaks about this, he says he once went to a shrita where they were doing um, shackling hoisting, and he, he asked them this question, well, how do you avoid this problem of, of it being a drasa? So he said, well, no problem, we just, when we hang it up there, we just let it thrash around, and be mafarches, until it wears itself out, and by the time it wears itself out, then then we go and we head and shecht it. So there's, of course you can think about the horrible tzav v'chaim to leave the animal till that point, and you have to wonder what other kind of problems it could cause. What kind of other trefas it could cause by having an animal bang around like that for so long? Anyhow, not, not pretty. Okay, now, but the other angle that people come speak about this question of drasa is not, so to speak, from the practical of did you cause a drasa, but um, is is there a iser to shecht in this way because it might cause a drasa? Meaning, the first thing I spoke about was, did, does it actually cause it to be a drasa? But maybe it didn't actually cause it. But it might be that it's also altogether to do that. Um, and that, um, that maybe, um, that, that, so, so what it is is like this. Um, we are not going to talk about all the details of that. There are many, many details to that, Shaila. Um, what it is, is in, in short, is basically the Gemara says, seems to say, the way Rashi learns it, that, that when you shecht an animal, you can shecht an animal um, there's two ways the Gemara's terms are for how you shecht an animal. You could shecht it milamayla lamata, with the shechet on top, and the knife comes from milamayla lamata to the animal who's below, and that's much more kal. That's more easy to be to do a shechet in that way. Um, and and another way to shecht is milamata lamayla, with the shechet and the knife are below the the neck, and they're shecht in an upward motion, with to the neck, which is lamayla. And the Gemara tells, says that there are less things that are mutter when it's milamata lamayla. When the neck is above, there are less things that are mutter. Okay? And the simple reading according to Rashi um, of the Gemara is that um, what, we, what we're what we describing over here, which is the animals being held in place, and the sheikh uses moves his knife to shech the, the, the animal, is kosher l'chatchila if it's milamata lamayla. That's the simple reading of the Gemara. The Ramam appears like that. The Ramam, who says also you could check them both there, whether the animal's above or below, the way Lech Mishnah explains, the Ramam also means that it's even l'chatchila to do that, even if the animal, if it's milamata lamayla, the animal, the, the head is above the knife. Um, and the Shach, the, again, the simple reading in the Shach is that again, to, like this, din, like we we're just saying, that it's mot even l'chatchila. Comes along the pre is a cash on the Shach, based on the Gemara, and the primary answer to that question comes from a simul chadasha, and the simul chadasha wants to answer up why did, are there some impressions that milamata lamayla you're not allowed to shecht it l'chatchila, you're not allowed to do that l'chatchila, and the simul chadasha says that the the answer is like this: if the animal's head is held in place by hand, somebody hold literally the people grabbing the animal's head. That is l'chatchila not allowed milamata lamayla because the animal might slip. The animal wants to move, or it's easy for the animal to move when it's standing, when its head is straight up. It's easier for it to move, and therefore people holding on, people might not hold onto it well enough, and the animal could slip. It would be a drasa. Only if the animal says on the floor, it's more relaxed and more calm and more controlled. That's when you can do that. But the pre, but the simchatasha says, but if the if the animal's head is held not by hand, but the animal's head is held. Like some kind of a device, it's tied down, or some kind of a brace, or some kind of a bar, something that holds it in place, something uh, physical that's not like a human who's subject to you know being yanked one way or the other by the animal. Then that's the case with the shachas, it's mutter, and that's the case that the gemara, etc. Everyone would say that it's mutter to do it milamata lamayla. Okay, that's how the simchadash learns. Um, uh, most of the poskim, a long list of poskim, accept that that's that that's correct. That's pshat in, in this thing. Um In in the Daki Chua brings a different answer, 
um, he bring, he talks there from a minchas azevach, but if you turn back in the minchas azevach, he's bringing from a sefer called Darachayim, and Darachayim says he has a different answer to the prechalish's kasha, and the way he answers the kasha, n- none of those cases are lechatchil, even if it's held by a, a device, by like a like a tie down or something like that, it's still not mutal lechatchil to do milamatel ma'ila. But the yeah, evidence okay, but not lechatchil to do milamatel ma'ila. So <coughs> most of the <coughs> later achronim. Except what the Simcha Dasha says. Um, it's what Ramosha says in Dain Weiss, or Rebelski, and the Satmarov, and the Nirvatarov, all say, like Ramosha says, or all say, I'm sorry, like the Simcha Dasha says, which is that if the if the head is tied down, if the head is tied down, then even Milamata Lamail is Mod Luchatchila. It's completely Mutter to do Luchatchila. Some, the Kle Boysim, and Nasan, and Mishnah Lachas, they say, no, you should be Machmir for this other Shita of the Minchas Azevach, who they bring was a big. Uh, uh, an important person, a significant person, and they, they say, no, you should be machmer for that sheet and say, you can't, milamata lamayla, doesn't work even if you tie the animal down. L'chatchila is not a way to shech, even if you tie the animal down. So, um, so again, most people follow what Ramosha says, which is, Ramosha and the others, all these other names who I mentioned, that as long as the animal's head is tied down, then it's mutter. Ramosha even really wants to be even more make on. See, even if you held it by hand, really, it's mutter. But he says, no, we should be machmer for the, machmer for the Simcha Dasha, to say that at least it has to be held down um, it has to be held down by 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 strings or uh, uh, pole or something. Something has to hold it down to brace. Okay, so in which case, in which case, um, when we have an animal that's being held, that's by shchitut chuyah. That's what Ramosha is speaking about. Shchitut chuyah. Ramosha says it would be okay to shech now. Shchitut chuyah. The shchit is milmat lemaila. The animals, the animal is hanging down and the head is pulled back, so the head is now higher than the shchit and the shchit shechts it an upward motion um so Ramosha says it's only mutter if they hold if they tie the animal's head down if they just hold it by hand but a human bunch of people holding onto it would not be enough and that caused a change in how people practice people started following what Ramosha said that they would tie the animal's head rather than just hold it um hold it by hand so again that that avoids the potential is there maybe an iser to do that of course we have to avoid actually being a dross also now um <clears throat> so that that was the, that was the big one of the big questions that had to do with shchitut chuyah was there actual drasa or was it uh, is it to do it, to do it like this because it potentially could lead to a drasa. Now, some of the places can, as this, this is like sort of now just uh, today this is considered not a relevant point. Some of the places spoke about the fact that um, a shaykh when he shechs for the in a way that he's not a typical way to shech in an unusual way. Excuse me. <clears throat> needs to do that with other people watching him. And some unusual ways to shech, like sitting down, you're not allowed to do it all because it's such an, 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 an a strange position for a shech to be sitting to be in that that's not considered a kasher shechita. So there were those who raised the issue and they said as well, shech de milamata lamayla, it's very unusual. Whoever shech like that, everybody shechs face, you know, with the animal down. So therefore, it should not be kasher for that reason. You know, that, so that was a, a reasonable point to bring up when this first came, you know, into style. But like the Nirvarta says, he says nowadays, you know, most the most shechtim have never shechted in a, in a downward fashion. They all use a pen fa- facing up. Oh, I'll get the pens in a second. Or the or the shechita three. They always do it in a way that's facing upwards. So that point is moot at this point. We're not really relevant um, right now. Most shechtim have plenty of experience doing it that way. Okay. So now, uh, 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 before we move on to the next type, which is the the upright pen, I, I do need to notice the following. Mention the following. Um, the pen, the 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 truya that there is, uh, works for any animal. The pens that we're going to talk about in a minute are mainly for behemoth gases. But now that I've mentioned this thing that Ramosha says that, and again, with many before him, that the animal needs the head needs to be tied down when you do the when you do the shrita, If you do milmata lamayla, raises the question that um, at some lamb shritas, again, before I get to that one, by some lamb shritas they do perfectly fine. The animals laid down. Um, either on the floor, not on the floor anymore, but on some kind of a bed or some kind of a brace, and the animal's laid down, so the shechitas mila mila lamata, from, from the knife is above the animal, and there's no problem, whoever holds the animal's head makes no difference. But in, in a different shechita that I was at, um, that shechts lamb, the, the animal was basically in a standing position. It wasn't in a pen that I'm going to describe in, in a minute, it was in some kind of device that sort of held it still, um, but the head was not restrained at all, and the head needed an operator. The head, a person had to stand there and physically hold the head into place. 
uh, and the sheikh would check from from be- the knife was below the neck and it checked it up. So the question was, well, how does that work? Um, it, don't we know that you need to have it secured? By it. it has to be tied down or held down in some kind of a device. You can't just you hold it down by hand. Um, when I asked that to the Rav Mashir, he says, no, that thing is only for a behemoth gasa, for a, like cattle, but not for behemoth daka, like a sheep or a goat. That doesn't apply for, for behemoth daka. Um, so that, that's an answer, but it's hard to justify that answer when um, Rav Mashir says, says nothing like that. And the Sim Chadasha, which is where this all starts from, this whole sheet that starts from Sim Chadasha, says specifically, I'm saying this for behemoths and for oifers. And, and he even speaks out. He says, when I say behema, I mean behema daka and behema gasa. So it's hard to, to, to justify how, um, the, the, to say that this din doesn't apply for behema daka um, and why a person should allow uh, to be that animal to be restrained by hand in those places. Okay. So now we move on to the, the what we call the ASPCA pen or the upright pen. Uh, and it's called an upright pen because, as I mentioned, the animal in this pen is going to stand up perfectly as if he's standing on the floor. And what it is, is the pen is basically a box, like a, a, a rectangular box laying on its side. The animal walks into the box <clears throat> from the back, and um, there's a hole in the front that its head can fit out of. So what happens is as the animal walks in, there's a pusher in the back that pushes the animal in and f- basically forces him to get all the way to the front of the box, and his head sticks out of the hole that there is in the front of the box. Then the walls on the sides uh, come in together to hold the animal. So there's two, the walls holding him on the side, squeezing him from the side, and the, something pushing him from the back. So the animal is sort of held very tightly in place in the, in the pen. And then, in some cases, there's a, a belly lift, which is something that comes up from underneath that lifts the animal up a few inches off the ground so the animal is no longer standing on the floor, just hanging there. Again, it helps hold the animal in place. The animal can't move where it's standing. Now the head that's that's sticking out the front, there's like a little window in the front. The head, um, what com- coming from below the animal's chin, comes with what's called a chin lift. It lifts the chin up like a bar. It's like a metal bar, usually a semicircle, and it lifts the animal's chin up as high as it can. Um, and sometimes there's something on the top that pushes down the animal's head also. So the sandwich the animal's head between the chin lift and this bar from the top. There's some is or isn't. Um, so now the animal's head is wide. <coughs> the, the neck is. The animal's head is lift, lift, lifted high up, um, the neck is stretched, stretched out, and the shechid can come ahead and do a shechid. So th- this pen, um, this type of a pen, avoids lots of the issues that we spoke about. There's no patav al-chayim, because the animals happen to be very happy and comfortable usually. There's no buku da'ama problems. Uh, or much as the animal has to be held in place by a brace, by, not by hand, it's held by, here it is. Um, and that's great. So again, if you think that milamata lamaila never works, then you will not go for this kind of a pen. But again, everybody who assumes that you can do milamata lamaila as long as it's held not by a human being would be okay with this pen. Should be okay with this pen. The only thing to consider is um, that the, the the benefits of this pen may actually be cause an issue, and that is the benefit of the pen is that it's built to hold the animal securely. The animal's happy and calm, that's for sure, but the, it holds the animal securely with this um, this chin lift that comes up and, and sometimes there's a piece on the top that holds the animal's head in place rather than a person holding it. So that's good, but the downside of that is is that it basically it's one size fits all, which is to say is depending on the type of cattle that a, a slaughterhouse gets, they'll get a pen to match the size of those cattle. And the bigger or smaller, the pen has to be a match for the, 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 the size of the cattle they're going to have. But in the end of the day, the pen is only one size. So if you have an animal whose head is particularly large or particularly small for the average of that place, that animal's head is not going to be held so well to the pen, in, in, in this brace. The, this chin lift is not going to hold it so well. So it could hold many different sizes. Um, you know, 9 out of 10 or nine, you know, 20 out of 21 are going to be perfectly fine. But there are those that are going to be not good enough and the animal will have a little wiggle room within that brace. Um, and that wiggle room is the potential for an animal moving its head. Um, like you see in this picture, um, the animal's an animal's head is not per- a perfect fit into here. This actually was part of a video where you could have seen the animal actually move his head during the shechita, which made people wonder that actually it was a juice up. Um, <clears throat> I thought that was a little too gory to put on the video. But, um, but the, you see there's at least space here and the animal can wiggle his head um, and if it wiggles his head at the wrong time, then we have a problem of a dresser. So, um, 
so the the the, uh, the overall having the pen is wonderful for pre- preventing drusa and for satisfying Ramush's requirement that the animal be held um, by a device. Um, but just a little question, and there's also questions that maybe sometimes it's too tight, and little questions of maybe it's a misukhenes. Uh, okay, those don't seem to be such serious concerns. Okay, and our last thing to speak about is the rotating pen. Uh, what I first described as the Weinberg pen. Um, the Weinberg pen um, was was not accepted in the United States. Even in England, they later had lots of questions on it, and Diane Weiss spoke about that maybe um, they should make improvements to satisfy um, those concerns and take care of the problems so the Weinberg pen should be okay. Um, and they it built very similar to the American pen, at least in, theoretically, it's built in the in same kind of a way. There's of course no belly lift because this animal is gonna be rotated. After the animal fits into the pen and it's held in place, the whole pen rotates 180 degrees and the animal ends up basically laying on its back. So of course there's no belly lift laying on its back. Um, so it has the same chin lift. Everything is held, it's held in place in lots of, lots of great ways. And um, of course, this doesn't have any problems with milmata lamaila. This, this uh, here you shechting milmata lamata. That the sheikh and his knife are above the animal's neck. So there are those like like can I buy some some of those things I mentioned before and who promote this and say, yeah, well, let's go with we should go with a a, a pen with animal lays on its back. Um, it's traditional and it avoids a lot of a lot of these um, issues that there could have been um, as a way to do shechita.